As you're seated, if you would take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Ephesians. Turn to Paul's letter to Ephesus. You'll find that in the New Testament. If you're using one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you, the black hardbacks, you can find that on page 977. Specifically, Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at the first six verses this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 1, it is written, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me and let's pray together. Father, Son, and Spirit, we bless you, our great God who has called us, who are in Christ out of darkness and into the marvelous light of Your Son to know and worship You through the indwelling, enabling power of Your Spirit. And we pray even now as we come to Your Word, we come with the conviction that what Your Word teaches is true, that as Your Word is read and opened, You are speaking yet still. Your Spirit is communicating to us still calling us to the singular hope we have in Christ and to walk faithfully before Him. We pray Your Spirit would be active among us and for us who are hearing Your Word to put off all that would hinder or distract us or that we would might resist what You are saying to us. And we pray Your Spirit would be using the One who expounds Your Word to be faithful and clear as You intend to edify and build up Your church in love. We ask these things, Father, that You do have the glory in your church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes things in the church get confusing because we use biblical words in ways the Bible never does. Case in point is here in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, the word calling. If you hear that word calling in the church or used by Christians, You're usually talking about a specific ministry or an area of service that someone's been called by God. That's how we'll use it. We'll talk about the calling of a pastor, perhaps, or a missionary. Or we'll ask maybe one of them, well, when were you called? Or do you feel called? Or Christians will describe themselves in a particular area of ministry and say, well, I was called to to this ministry. I was called to that Or Christians will think even within themselves, well, am I called to this or that or the other? And by using the word calling this way, most of us in the church have the impression that calling is something specific, it's something unique, it's something individual, it's a special or overwhelming desire for special few Christians. But do you know, the Bible never uses the word calling in this way. Not once. And that many of our assumptions about calling are really foreign to the Bible. With calling here in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, Paul is summarizing the first three chapters of this book. That's why we have the grand therefore here at the beginning of this chapter. We're basically at Ephesians 4 at the intersection of this book. In chapters 1 to 3, Paul has explained what he says at the end of verse 1 here, the calling to which you have been called. And so beginning in chapter 4 now and through chapter 6 of Ephesians, he's now explaining how therefore you are to live because of it, in response to it. In other words, after hearing already all that God has done and will do in Christ, how shall we therefore live? That's what Ephesians 4 is beginning to answer. If you're a Christian, Ephesians 4 answers the question of how am I to respond 
to God in Christ, to His grace in the Gospel. If you're not a Christian, you're here this morning, and maybe you're considering the claims of the Bible and of Christianity, Ephesians 4 explains just that, true Christianity. We can even use it to investigate where ought we see, where is evidence that God is at work in this world. In Ephesians 4, these first six verses we want to look at, the Holy Spirit is saying to us that the first and most basic way that Christians respond to the grace of God is living together in unity. The most fundamental, the most foremost response to God's grace is living together in unity as the church. And what I want to do is just unfold three observations, three parts of this little brief paragraph. In verse 1, we'll talk about consistency with our calling. Verses 2 and 3, I want to discuss and look at congregating around our call. And then in verses 4 to 6, the community of the God who calls. Consistency, congregating, and community. Well, let's look first at verse 1, consistency with our calling. And really, we see here, wonderfully, the Christian life is pretty straightforward and simple. And it boils down, verse 1, to walk in a manner worthy. Now, walk is a familiar metaphor in the Bible. If you're familiar with the Bible, you know it's everywhere. It goes all the way back, actually, to the garden in creation in Genesis when we walked with God before sin had interrupted and destroyed our relationship with Him. We lived before God. And since then, walk is used by God throughout His Word in the Old and New Testament to describe the pattern or the course of our life. How you walk is how you live. It's the pattern of your living. It's why our Lord Jesus spoke of life as a way. And He said there's two ways you can live. There's a broad way that leads to destruction, a pattern of living, rejecting God and sin that leads to judgment. And there's a narrow way of trusting Him and relying on Him, a pattern of living before God by faith in Christ that leads to eternal life. How you walk is how you live before God. And so Christians are called to live before God in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And if we read that as meaning, walk so that you are worthy of the calling, we're going to miss it entirely, the point. It doesn't mean that even remotely. Walk so that you are worthy. No, and as we'll look at with calling, there's no way to be worthy of it. That's actually the whole point. No, the the word there, worthy, you could really translate that as even in balance with or consistent with. It's a word that that means uh, in balance, equal weight. It was actually used to refer in the ancient world to balanced scales. You would have weights of equal size weighing itself out in balance. So walk in a manner in balance with the calling with which you've been called. Consistent with, we might say equal to this calling. In other words, what Paul is saying is that Christians are to see the weight of grace that God has dropped on one side of the scales. And then they respond according to it, consistent with it, the weight of that calling. And by that, as I've already said, Paul is assuming everything he's already said in Ephesians 1, verse 3. So as you can probably already tell, it would be impossible to even remotely understand what he's talking about if we don't even have at least some grasp of what's going on from Ephesians 1 to 3. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to do a 10,000 foot overview of Ephesians 1 to 3. You could drown in Ephesians 1 to 3 for the rest of your life. We won't be doing that. We'll be skinning the surface. And if we were to hang a banner, or we were going to give a theme to Ephesians 1 to 3, it would be this. For His glory, God is uniting everything in Jesus Christ. That's the point of Ephesians 1-3. to For God's glory, He's uniting everything in heaven and on earth in Jesus Christ. And Paul is basically arguing in these three chapters that that is the point of the universe, actually. That is what all God is doing. Now we both know, even as you hear that, and as we'll see the word united in a couple significant places in Ephesians 1-3, to our world is anything but united. 
We live in a world marked by division, separation, destruction, decay, death. But we usually forget why. Because creation, the universe, wasn't created that way. It didn't begin separated, chaotic. We were created in a unity of peace, walking with God. Everything was joined in Him. But once we, our parents, the human race, rebelled against God in sin and turned away from Him, we were judged and separated from Him. We were exiled from His presence and cast out of His perfect place. And our entire universe was cursed. Was brought, everything was brought into disorder. That's why we have hurricanes. That's why we have cancer. That's why we will all one day eventually die. Because of the curse of God on everything. The universe. All of creation including us. And when that separation from God occurred and we rebelled against Him in sin, that also then blossomed into all the hatred and mistrust and violence and warfare that exists in the human race relationally. Rebelling against God, people became strangers to one another because really the uniting issue of the human race is we're all made in the image of God. And once that is rejected, then humanity no longer has any real meaning anymore. We see that if you go back to the book of Genesis, the first murder came from the first family. The two brothers, Cain and Abel, became enemies. And from since then, humanity in sin, we've lived as suspicious strangers to each other in hostility. Each one of us living for ourselves and fighting for power and provision in this cursed world. And all the horrors of all the holocausts, of all the wars, of all the tragedies that are still going on today, that is their very root. The sinful suspicion we have and hostility to one another. But before any of this happened, look at Ephesians 1 verse 4. Before the foundation of the world, He chose us in Him. Before the foundation of the world means in eternity. Before time began. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit planned to rescue and fix His creation that would be disordered in sin and refuse Him. And as God describes it here in this first 14 verses of chapter 1, each person of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit was at work to rescue His creation to the praise of His glory. You see that three times. Verse 6, verse 12, verse 14. To the praise of His glory. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are working to rescue creation. To rescue sinners to Him. Notice verse 4, the Father chose us in Him, His Son, in Christ, to be holy and blameless. And this is, if you notice the end of verse 4, beginning of verse 5, in His love He predestined us to be adopted as His children. Rebels are brought into His family. Why? Paul says in verse 5, why would God do this? End of the verse, according to the purpose of His will. Because He wanted to. Because in His loving kindness, He wanted to bring rebels back into His family. So that, verse 6, His glorious grace would be praised. All that God gives, end of verse 6, in the Beloved. That's His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He gives so that He might be praised for all He's done. And then beginning in verse 7, Paul begins to talk about how the Son accomplished all of this. The Son achieved it all. Verse 7, redemption through His blood. In Jesus' death, those who trust Him are redeemed. They're bought out. That's language from a slave market. It's having your ownership reclaimed. And in sin, we're bondage to death and judgment. And by the blood of Christ, suffering judgment on behalf of sinners, sinners are bought out from under that slavery into the freedom of forgiveness in God. Verse 7, the forgiveness of our trespasses. This is all the riches of God's grace as He's poured and lavished upon us. It was, as Paul says, end of verse 8, God's wisdom and insight to do this. It was, we notice in verse 9, The mystery of His will, His purpose. And you want to read that word mystery not as mysterious or mystical, but as a secret. 
what God hadn't told people what he was going to do, but now he's made it known in Christ. He's made it plain in Christ. The secret of his will. Because God, verse 10, has a plan. Has had a plan before anything happened. What is God's plan? What is going on in the fullness of time when all is said and done as all is wrapped up and eternity past enters into eternity future and time and creation are done as we know it now? What's the plan? Verse 10, underscore and note this, to unite all things in Him. That's Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. To bring together, to sum up, to join everything In Jesus Christ. Everything that's been disordered by sin and rebellion and curse, God is putting back together again. In His Son, Jesus. Everything is to be united in Him. In a world of love, an existence of unity, a new heaven and a new earth united in Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, look at verse 11, the wonderful news, you have that as your inheritance. That is your promise. You've been predestined according to His purpose. The one who, by the way, end of verse 11, works everything after the counsel of His will. And so you don't have to worry about whether or not His plan will or will not be accomplished because everything works according to His plan. There's nothing outside of it. So everything in existence is moving that everything would be united in Christ. That we would praise His glory. Verse 12. But there's more to say. The work of the Spirit in bringing sinners to Christ. Paul begins in verse 13. In Him also, when you heard the word of truth, this gospel of your salvation, and trusted Him, believed in Him, relied on Christ, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means possessed or owned. You were bought and owned by God. So the Spirit's presence, verse 14, He's the guarantee of that inheritance. You could translate guarantee as down payment. How do you know one day that everything will be united to Christ and you'll be part of everything? Well, because you're already united to Him now. By the presence of the Spirit, you have the guarantee that everything will be united to Christ because you're already united in Christ until you eventually acquire possession of everything being united in fullness of time. And if you look just with me at the end of the chapter, verse 22, as Paul prays that Christians grasp this, we're reminded that everything has been put under Christ's feet and He is head over all things has been given to the church. And the church is, verse 23, His body, His fullness. The church is the beginning of the great uniting of existence. Everything is being united to Christ in heaven and on earth, and it's begun with the church. Sinners joined to Jesus Christ. Well, how is this experienced? How does it work? And that's what Paul begins to unfold in chapter 2. Before becoming a Christian, verse 1, we were dead in trespasses and sins. And that doesn't mean you weren't accountable. It's not a passive death. Look what Paul goes on to say. Verse 3, you are living in the passions of your flesh, doing what you wanted with your body and your mind. And so by nature, like the rest of mankind, you were a child who deserved the wrath of God. Children of wrath, even like the rest. In short, Paul says, you were doing what you want, however you wanted, living for yourself. And the reason he says in verse 1, that's death, is because there's no life with God. You're dead. You don't know the God who's even sustaining you physically. So you're spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But God, verse 4, in His great love, even, verse 5, even in that deadness, made us alive together with Christ. He gave life and birthed life to an awareness of Him. And and just in case you're missing the point, Paul interjects into verse 5, by grace you've been saved. It's by His grace. That God would rescue you and make you alive when you were dead. And that's worth repeating. So he does, verse 8. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, it's, it's God's gift. Even your faith comes from the loving hand of God to give it to you. That you would believe. 
There's no, no working here that you've accomplished so that no one will boast. No one's bragging about knowing God because He's done it. And even when He makes you new in Jesus and unites it, you to Him, verse 10, and you live in good works, those are just what God's already prepared for you to do. He did it, so you would do it. It's all by grace. It's all, it's all His remaking us in Christ. And this has always been the plan. That's what Paul goes on to say in verse 11. It's always been this plan. Even when God called his special people Israel. You see, the world really boils down to just two categories. We have many ethnicities and people groups and language groups we recognize, but really they all boil down to two. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. You're part of God's special covenant people by birth or you're not. And so Paul is addressing here, verse 11, Gentiles in the flesh, probably the vast majority of us, Gentiles, who are outside the commonwealth, as he mentions in verse 12, of Israel. Now sadly, the short story of the Old Testament and the story of Israel is Israel was not essentially different from the rest of the nations. And that's basically the story of the Old Testament. That even God's own people were afflicted by the same sin the same self-serving, the same living for themselves and spiritual death as everyone else. But, we're reminded in verse 12, they did have covenants of promise. They were stewards of God's Word. They had God's prophets speaking to them and telling them it won't always be this way. God will rescue and redeem. And they had that. They They had that Word of God. But if you're a Gentile, it ain't your Word. You don't have it. You have, end of verse 12, no hope and no God in this world. But, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, those who were far off, those Gentiles, who have no claim on God's covenant promises, have been what? They've been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. You see, Christ has actually, verse 14, made us both, Jew and Gentile, one. And that dividing wall of hostility, that separation of we have God's Word, we're His people, and you don't, that's gone. Because verse 15, the law of commandments expressed in ordinance has been abolished by Christ. Well, how did Christ abolish it? He did it all. Perfectly. The only Jew ever to faithfully follow his God perfectly. The only perfect man this world has ever seen. And he fulfilled all of God's just requirements. And by his death, he suffered the judgment that sinners deserve that he did not. So that, verse 16, through the cross, God's reconciled us both. You're a Jew and you're a sinner. You need Christ. You're a Gentile. You're a sinner. In Christ, you can be reconciled to God. You trust him. And the hostility now is gone. Because at the end of the day, Jew or Gentile, what are we sinners in need of salvation? We need someone to suffer the judgment that we ought to have and to bring us to God and to remove that separation. And that's what Christ did. Verse 17, He came and He preached peace to Gentiles and to Jews. And peace is not a program, it's Him. As Paul says in verse 18, through Him, through Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one Spirit to the Father. Through Christ, regardless of your background, you might know God and be joined to Him. You see, the uniting of all things has begun. There's no more categories among men. Those who had promises and those who were hopeless are both brought to God through Christ. Whoever you are on the face of the earth can know God by trusting His Son, Jesus. And that's that's always been the plan. That those dead in sin might be joined together in trusting God in Christ. And the wonderful result, look at verse 19. Remember again, Paul's primarily dressing Gentiles. So you're not strangers and aliens anymore. Your fellow citizens with the saints, your members of God's household, remember He predestined to adopt you. And as you've trusted His Son, you're now brought into His home. 
His home being built on His Word He's giving through His apostles and prophets. And notice in verse 21, it's all being joined together as a holy temple. A temple in the Lord. Being built together, verse 22, into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. As God's Spirit indwells His people and brings them to Him, where His people gather, that's His temple. That's His place. The church is now the temple of God on earth. This is the gospel. This is Christianity. We all have rejected the God who made us and deserve His judgment, deserve all the hardship of this cursed world. But God in love sent His Son Jesus to live the perfect life no one has ever lived and to do so as an offering, a sacrifice, in our place, die and suffer our judgment on that cross. And by the shedding of the blood of the Son of God, those who trust Him do not need to fear their blood being shed in judgment anymore. That God's judgment won't fall on them. It's already been done in Christ. And you can trust Him and know God. And even more, you can through the Spirit worship God and be known by Him. And one day when the fullness of time is ended, be know that uniting with Christ in all things forever. All by trusting Christ. Believing this Gospel. Relying on Him. And when you do, you find not only that God owns you now, but He knew you before He made anything. All who trust His Son. This is the Gospel. And Paul rejoices in chapter 3 in essence to say, what a privilege to preach this. What a privilege to be set apart and make this known. As he says in verse 6, that, that great secret that the Gentiles are actually fellow heirs and in one body with Christ. And he goes on, he says, this is the plan that God wants me to bring to light in verse 9. I'm preaching, so this secret is made known. The plan that God's hidden in Himself, but now is making known to everyone. And why? Verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, if you went to chapter 6, verse 12, or if you went to the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 15, you would discover that when Paul writes rulers and authorities in heavenly places, he's talking about satanic, demonic authorities. He's talking about forces of spiritual evil. And you see the, what Paul is arguing here, there and for God's purposes, those forces of spiritual evil that have tempted and sought to lead sinners away from God to perpetrate the destruction and the division on this earth, God points to His church and says, I win. My wisdom is made known. I don't lose my creation. I had a plan before I made it. And they're rescued. And you can see it in the church. The uniting of everything in heaven and earth is begun because sinners from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, both Jews and Gentiles, are being united to Christ now in the church. The hostility is gone. And so in the church, the wisdom of God is seen. The victory of God's plan is seen. In the church, God says, I win. And so as Paul ends chapter 3, look at verse 21. He ends with the prayer and the benediction to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Because the church proves what God has done in Christ. And all that, boom! Boom! is the weight of God's grace on one side of the scale. And Paul says in chapter 4, Therefore, walk consistently with the calling with which you've been called. You look at that, and you walk worthy of that. Do you see how that overturns so many assumptions we have for Christians? It reframes everything. And the first and the foremost is that every Christian has the same calling. We're all called to ministry. And our calling is to serve the greater plan of God in the church. Christians are called together in Christ. And the together is the, actually the entire point. It's the whole point. 
I really can't improve, I don't think, on an essay that Carl Truman wrote. You can still get it online. It's an unmessianic sense of non-destiny. He writes really strange titles. But it's worth reading more than once. One excerpt. My special destiny as a believer is to be part of the church. And it is the church that is the bigger player in God's plan, not me. That puts me, my, my uniqueness, my importance, my role in definite perspective. The problem today is too many have the idea that God's primary plan is for them and the church is secondary. And Truman goes on and says, Seize with both hands the opportunity to grasp you have no special destiny which sets you apart from everyone else in the church. When you take calling out of the Bible, you, you miss it entirely. The church does not exist to fulfill the callings of Christians. It is our calling. We're all called, if we're in Christ, to God's plan in the church. Not a special purpose, but God's purpose. To show forth His wisdom, even to the heavenly places. Consistency with our calling. That's the main point of the Christian life. Now look how Paul then unpacks that in verses 2 and 3 as we talk about congregating around this call. Congregating around our call. What could it mean like to live consistently with what we've just seen? What could it look like? That God is uniting all things in Christ and showing it in the church. What would be the most basic and most critical action in response? Well, of course, it's how Christians live together in the church. If God is glorified in the church, then how we live together is of literally eternal consequence. And so Paul gives these basic commands in verses 2 and 3. There's four character qualities in verse 2, and there's one motivation and goal in verse 3. Let's look at some of these qualities Paul describes in verse 2. First, all humility. Having the highest degree of not considering yourself or regarding yourself. And with all you've seen, how how could we? Before we were created, God chose us in Christ. When we were dead and we were hopeless, God made us alive and brought us near in Christ. God graced us to be a part of the new humanity He's uniting in His Son. How could you respond to any of that and say, well, now we're getting down to me. It's about me now. No, so with all humility... Secondly, with with gentleness. Gentleness is not timidity necessarily, it's restraint. An older translation is meekness. And you still even use that if you work with horses. You meek a horse. It means to be brought under control. Gentleness means self-controlled, restrained. It means you're you're consciously self-controlled, especially when you're provoked. When something irritates or bothers or angers you, you have a calm bearing. Restraining your impulses. Don't run off. That's gentleness. Thirdly, there's patience. Patience is very close to gentleness. It's just gentleness for a long time. The old translations used to call this long-suffering, which might be a better even way to say it, enduring. It was used, this Greek word was used of cities that were enduring sieges. They were patient under provocation. You know God's eternal purpose. You know that in the midst of everything, it can be endured because God has a plan. He's working all things after the counsel of His will. You've already experienced it, being united to Christ. It can be endured. And finally, verse 2, bearing with one another in love. Or you could translate that as some do tolerating one another in love. Mutually recognizing differences, disagreements, even perhaps minor offenses but loving each other in the midst of them. Kind of like a family. A family that was predestined before the foundation of the world. And by the blood of God's Son brought into loving union together in Him, knowing they'll be assembled for all eternity before Him. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance or tolerance, Don't miss the reality behind all of these things. There is no romantic or unrealistic views of the church in the Bible. If we get cynical about the church, it's not because we took the Bible too seriously. 
because the Bible gives us a very real perspective about life in the church. There are going to be things you need to be humble about and swallow your pride more than once a day. You're going to have to be gentle and self-controlled and patient with people. Even impatient, it was pointed out to me recently that when impatient people bother me, that's impatience. Just think about that. It's terrible. (laughs) Patience. Bearing with one another in love. There's going to be things you're going to have to tolerate just because you love somebody because they're in Christ. The assumption here is the assumption, and we could go to many places in the Bible, the assumption here is that Christians living together are going to bother, provoke, irritate, and offend each other. And it's all in how we respond that makes the difference. The fact of disagreements and differences and conflicts and irritations and pet peeves, those are a given. Those are taken for granted. What sets Christians apart, what shows God's wisdom to the universe, is how Christians respond in the midst of them. And really, this is, I think, a wonderful encouragement to us. Our disagreements are nothing to be afraid of. It's our love in the midst of them. Our love and toleration and patience across all of our differences for all of the varying reasons we are different. And that is what preaches. The old apologist from the previous generation, Francis Schaeffer, said, this is our final apologetic, our final defense. What is the final proof we have to give to the world that Jesus Christ has come, has died for sinners, and has risen again Schaefer says it's how Christians love each other. He goes on and says this, If I'm not willing to ask forgiveness when I've wronged somebody, especially if I haven't loved him, I've not even begun to think about the meaning of Christian unity that the world can see. At that point, the world has a right to question whether I am a Christian. And more than that, let me say it again, if I'm not willing to do this very simple thing, loving and forgiving The world has a right to question whether Jesus was sent from God and whether Christianity is true or not. The final defense and proof that God has given in our world to the truth of the gospel is how Christians live together. It's the love they have for each other. If you're not a Christian this morning, this is how you separate true Christianity from imposters. Christians love each other even though they're different. Have conflict, differences, yes. Even fight sometimes, yes, like every good family. But love each other in the midst of them. And there's no other reason for that love but Jesus Christ. And that's the point. That is the gospel that God is proclaiming to the world. Is how Christians are humble, gentle, patient, and lovingly endure each other. And the great goal Paul gives us in verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. The whole point of all the humility and patience and gentleness and tolerance is because we're to protect unity. And Paul here, ironically, at the beginning of verse 3, in Greek, he uses military terms that talk about peace. Eager to maintain. You could paraphrase that, zealous to guard. Using your energy and your intentionality to protect. Like a watchman watching over a precious jewel or doing the rounds on city walls. And what is the treasure that's being protected? The unity of the Spirit. The unity that is experienced in the bond or the relationships of peace. The peace that Christ created on the cross between sinners and God and therefore sinners and and one another. The peace where we're all members of one household if we trust Christ and we belong together. The peace of having access to God together That's to be protected because that's what the Spirit has done in the work of Christ. There's two very important things to observe about this command in verse 3. First, that unity is what God does. God creates it. There's nowhere in your Bible where you will find a command to create unity. Because you can't. People have been doing it since the garden. And we don't do a very good job as sinners at it. God does it. God does it. 
God reconciles people to himself in Christ and unites them to one another. Unity is God's creation. We can't create unity. But the second most important thing to see here, we can destroy it. We're commanded to preserve unity because we can undo it. And when the unity of God's people, unity in the church is destroyed or division happens, Rarely is it ever malicious or intentional or conscious. Rarely does someone set in their minds, I'm going to divide this church. I mean, it happens, but that's pretty rare. No, we're divisive when we fail to preserve unity because that's the command. It's to care about unity constantly because God's uniting all things in Christ. And the way He proves He's uniting all things in Christ is uniting sinners together in the church that His wisdom is shown in the church. And so the church is called to protect unity because God is literally preaching to the world through the church. And so we're, the command of the Bible is not don't be divisive. The command is preserve the unity of God's people. If we're not consciously seeking to protect the unity of the church, we're already divisive, whether we realize it or not. There's several ways we do this, however unintentionally it happens in churches. We can be divisive by only caring to hang out with our friends, those who are like us in natural ways that the world would understand. That's divisive. When we only tolerate those who agree with us on positions on fill in the blank. That's divisive. Putting up other standards other than the one that Christ has put. Him. Or when we profess Christ but won't join with other Christians as members together of a a local church, we're being divisive. We're separating from what God has brought together. Or if we have formally joined a church but we're just simply absent or on the margins or don't attend when the church gathers together or sporadic. It's not intentional, I understand that. It's not wickedly malicious, but it is divisive because it's not seeking to preserve the jewel of unity that God has created and is showing to the universe the truth of the gospel. It's remaining separate from those whom God has joined together so he could say to the heavenly places, look at my glory in Christ. Look at what I've done in the church. When we do these things, however unintentionally, what we're saying is, God, you may have a plan, but you know what? i got plans. So I'm going to do those. It's divisive. We undermine the very thing God is using to proclaim His wisdom to the world, the unity of His people. And really what this does is it helpfully reframes also how we evaluate the faithfulness of, of any church that we're a part of or encouraging others in. And maybe you've noticed, like I've noticed, that many of the things that we assume today are necessary about the church are nowhere in the Bible. Small groups, children's ministries, various evangelistic schemes and programs. They're nowhere. Paul never asked Timothy, how's the youth group going? Now, are any of these things bad or wrong? Of course not. But they're all expendable. They're options to do what the Bible calls us to do. But what's not expendable is how we do them or anything else. That's actually vital. It's who we are, regardless of what we do. It's the unity of God's people together. And really, this should change and encourage us who are evaluating our contribution to the church. Maybe we feel out of place, or maybe you're here this morning, you're a member of this congregation, and you haven't discovered any unique ability or strength or gift that's going to set you apart, praise God, you won't be tempted to pride. Be encouraged. And maybe you're sitting there, you're wondering, though, I haven't found it, so what's my ministry? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's your ministry. That's what you're called to do. That's what we're all called to do. Whatever else we're called to, that's what we're called to do. And as Christians, we embrace that our most basic ministry at the church, and most basic ministry among the people of God, is allowing ourselves to be known and getting to know other believers 
that we might lovingly care for them and display the gospel to the world. Be in such close contact with others that there's things that we're going to have to be gentle and patient and even tolerate because we have so intertwined our lives together in the church. That's challenging, isn't it? The reason we usually emphasize those other things, those programs and groups, because they're easier. <laughs> Being humble and gentle with one another. But this is what God has called us to do. It's how we congregate, congregate around our calling. Thirdly and finally, I want us to see the community of the called God. The community of the God who calls. That's where Paul goes in verse 4. He knows what he's just said is far from easy. So he does what's so common in his letters. He restates everything he just said in briefer form as a reminder. So Paul knows as this being read, as God's word is going out and God's people are being called to humility, gentleness, and patience, and you're starting to look around the auditorium and you're going, with him? i got to tolerate that? Really? And you start to think, this is getting hard. So God puts his arm around us and he says, remember... Verse 4, there's only one body and one spirit. And he goes on and he says, remember your calling in essence. And in verses 4 to 6, what Paul does in these three verses and these staccato references of one, Paul summarizes Ephesians chapter 1 that we've seen. And he works backward, not starting with the Father, but starts with the Spirit to the Son to the Father, working through the triune work of God in salvation. Remember, There's one body and one spirit, the body of Christ. And you all share, verse 4, one hope that belongs to your call. When the Spirit opened your eyes, what did He open your eyes to? The hope of Christ, of the inheritance of Him. And He brought you, therefore, to, verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You are united to and you submit to one ruler, one King, one Lord, Jesus Christ. And because there is one Lord, there is only one faith, one trust, one truth of Him. And there is one symbol that God has given to publicly represent union with Him, and that's baptism. You're united in Christ, trusting Him and displaying and proclaiming your trust in baptism. And finally, through Christ you are brought to one God and Father of all Christians. Whoever they are, they have one father of one family. And He is over all of us. He is through each of us in His Spirit and personally related to all of us in all as His adopted children. And we've been called, if you're a Christian, to life together in our triune God because God is summing up all things in Christ, in His Son, bringing us literally into Himself. So the life that Christians live is literally life in God. As His Spirit dwells them and brings them to Christ, to the Father. The deepest theology of the Bible. The workings of our triune God. Given to us so that we'd be humble and gentle and patient. Theology is not a trophy to put on your shelf so you can show what you know. It's not a weapon to use to tear others down with. It's a tool It's a tool to use in the most basic Christian obedience. That when you don't feel like being humble or gentle or patient, when the unity of the church is not high on your priority list because you're provoked, you remember, this person is indwelt by the Spirit of God, like me. They trust the Lord Jesus like me. We have one Father. We are brothers and sisters together. How could I not but be humble and gentle and patient and bear with them? It means if we're going to be united in truth and by faith, there's definitely going to be awkward moments. A lot of them. Because we don't avoid those awkward moments like the world does. And stay away from people who are different from you. Because it's awkward to be around people that don't think rightly like you think. But in the church, we recognize by faith, we have a lot of differences here. But you are called of the Spirit to our Lord Jesus by our Father. And so we're one. And whatever else we're dealing with, we're going to have to deal and begin with that. 
and we work from there. And we don't avoid the friendships and commitments that people normally avoid because they're difficult because of what God has done in Christ. And that is the miracle of God's saving work and that is what God is showing to the world. When Christians are lovingly humble with each other, the work of the Spirit, Son, and Father are made evident and clear. India is a nation that is deeply divided by the caste system of Hinduism, many religions, and a lot of other racial violence and separation. But a pastor in India made this comment about how the gospel is preached and shown there. He said this, Most of what happens in Christian churches, even some of the so-called miracles, can be duplicated among Hindus or Muslims. But in my area, only Christians strive to mix men and women together of different castes, different races, and different social groups. And that is the real miracle. That is what God is doing in the world. This is the real miracle. The testimony that God is giving to you this morning, if you are not a Christian, is the fact that different people love each other only because of Jesus. Think about Him and what that says about what He's done and what He's doing now. And Christian, this is our calling. The ministry of unity. Unity as a church. This is your ministry This is the most important thing about your Christian life and what you are called to serve. Proclaiming the glory of God to the universe. Let's pray. Our Father, we join with Paul. What a privilege to be joined to your Son and having the ministry of making known your work and glory in Christ to the heavenly places. Whatever happens in Sacramento, Father, we pray that you might be pleased in heaven. We pray that the accuser might be ashamed and humiliated as you look at your work in the church here. And we pray, Father, as we recognize and are convicted at how so many ways we fail and fail to grasp in faith how we in the most simple ways, conduct ourselves with each other. And the great spiritual truths that are being either affirmed or denied by our actions. Father, we pray you would help us live more consciously, knowing you've united us to your Son, you're uniting all things in Christ, and you've united us to one another, that we might proclaim your glory. Father, we do pray that the fullness of time would come soon and quickly, and until then, that you would make us faithful to preach your truth. We ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.